Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much to the ADB and the Institute for inviting me here. Um, I hope you think it's worth it at the end of the day. Right. Um, I come from the Freight Transport Association for the GMS region of ASEAN. For those of you who don't come from that area, it's the Greater Mekong sub-region, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and southern China. Now, it is a perfect example of the same thing of everybody else in this room, pretty much, for the developing countries, whether it be in Central Asia or be somewhere else. It's the same. Um, our problems are your problems. And they're exactly the same problems, and we work with different organisations in different places to compare them. So what I'm really doing here, I'm trying to work out how the computer works, right. I've gone back to look at the agenda and what we're talking about. And what we're talking about is the investment decisions. It's how you put policies in place in your countries to make me or him come and spend large amounts of money and build factories is the bottom line. Now, we all look at certain things when we're making investments. We look at the economic and political stability. We look at the cost of labour. We look at the market location, whether you're building for local or whether you're building for export. And then we look at the logistics setup. And too often, over the last 20, 30 years, people do the first and second and third and then build the factory and then say to the supply chain director, you've got a problem. Because they build them in the wrong place. Now, when you're building, you make an investment in all of your countries, which are all developing countries. You need to look at local transport, regional transport, intermodal, long distance, um, cross-border, air freight capacity, or come to air freight capacity because it's very critical, and your access to ports. Now, over the last 10, 8 years, we've done very well in building a lot of infrastructure, mainly with ADB's help. This is the bridge across the uh, Mekong, which is the second friendship bridge that goes from Mukhtahan to Savannah Ket. You'll see over here what it used to look like. That's the way the trucks used to go across. And then with large amounts of money from the ADB and Japan, it now looks like this. Right. But that's only the start of it. Because wherever you build something, the freight, the, the capacity and the demand determines the cost of the freight. It has got nothing to do with the distance. Now, I came in on the bus with Uli, who's German, and should know everything, right? And we had this discussion about distance and cost of freight. Let me get When you have a place like Phnom Penh, when you have a place like Cambodia, which has a magnificently developed a garment industry where people, the salaries are 61 or $65 a, a month and the exports are booming, but the, the airport is not big enough to get a small dog on. It is a very, very constricted airport. It's a very, very constricted airport because there's no wide body planes going in there. Everything is narrow body, single aisle. Eventually, there's a little bit more that's going in. So what happens? The exporters have to ship their freight out of Seattleville, down to Singapore, and transship it to Europe. So half the, the money that they saved in build, having the, the outsourcing to the factory with low-cost labor just went straight out the window because they spent an extra $1,000 a container, or 2000 or 3000 because of the logistics hadn't been thought through in the beginning. Another example of this is Hanoi in our region. Hanoi has got factory after factory after factory. Everybody's built a nice, beautiful new factory. But when the season comes and when the boom times for um, August, September, October, November, you actually have to truck 
from Hanoi to Bangkok to get on an aeroplane. And what's happening? You're losing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a, con a container just to do it because there is not the capacity to do it. So these are the decisions that we as investors make, but that you as policy makers can look at. Inviting people in to build is one thing, getting the product out is another. And you can completely destroy the business case, which I'll come to about it, because you offset the costs of labour, which goes to the costs of the goods sold because of your delays in logistics and your capacity in logistics. We have these problems all over the place. In Asia today, and uh, I'm looking at the GMS and ASEAN regions, but whether we're looking at Central Asia or whether we're looking at anybody else, the road transport challenges, we're not in Asia specifically. We are no longer supplying America. We are no longer supplying Europe or just America and just Europe. We're supplying China and China is supplying us and we're supplying Thailand and Thailand is supplying Vietnam. The great cross-border operations are developing big time and we are a long way behind in developing. It's not so much the infrastructure, right? We have to... In Central Asia, you manage to be able to let the trucks run through from one country to another country. In Europe, that was done when I had hair and before there was a single market. You could run trucks out of the UK into France, Italy, Germany, Spain, North Africa, back in the 60s and 70s, right? It's now a free and open market, but we still can't run a truck from Malaysia to Thailand. We still cannot drive the same truck from Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok. Why? We still cannot drive the same truck from Hanoi to China. Why? because of local policy issues, because of he said, we said, we can't organise this, we can't organise that. People say, do it by sea. I challenge you to do it by sea. Look at the issues that are going on now between um, the, the supplies into Myanmar. Right? To go to Myanmar, you have to go around a long way by sea. It's only that far across the east-west economic corridor from Mesot, from the end of the road, the Ewek, which is supposed to run all the way across to the port in um, Myanmar. It's not finished. The trucks can't move. You, we can't even operate two ways on the same day on the same road. Right? So your alternative is 12 days round by sea, or 10 days with transshipment and transshipment and transshipment. I hear a lot of things about people saying about uh, moving it by sea. But let's take a look at our seaports. I'm based in Hong Kong, and I used to be based in Singapore. They have two things in um, common. They are massive seaports. But have you ever noticed that Hong Kong doesn't actually produce anything? So why is it such an important seaport? One, because it is a deep seaport and you can get very, very large ships in there with very deep draft. But secondly, because it's a very, very, very easy way to move cargo. It goes through very smoothly. There's so few restrictions on it. It's a Transshipment is easy. Going out of a Chinese port can be a very long process. Going out of a Hong Kong port, they want you gone. Today, please, yesterday, quickly. It's the same with Hong Kong Airport. So when you're looking at policies for what you're making in your... Make your place the easiest place to do business. Your ports and your seaports and your airports. Freight is like water. It takes the line of least resistance. It goes the easiest way. It doesn't go the most difficult way. We have the situation in this part of the world 
where people spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on borders. And then they close them for lunch. There is a $500 million development, at least, at Xinjiang between China and, and Vietnam. It is open five hours a day, five days a week, because everybody goes to lunch at 12 o'clock and they come back at 3 o'clock. And they're not open on a Saturday, and they're not open on a Sunday, so there's trucks as far as you can see waiting to go through the border. A very simple thing that a policymaker can do something. But when we talk to customs, they say, oh, it's the border guard. When we talk to the border guard, oh, it's the immigration. Right? So policymakers, simple things don't all have to be breaches. They don't all have to cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. They could just be coordinating two departments to go to lunch at the same time. We are getting a tremendous amount of demand now for between Thailand, Vietnam, and China. Like I said, we're not <coughs> supplying America so much. We're not supplying Europe so much. They're still there, but the supply is intra-Asia. It's growing like crazy. We're getting customers that say, get it out of the air because the fuel is too expensive. The conventional sea freight is too slow. But the problem is that the borders where we're running through are not as smooth as they could be. If we can get the barriers reduced, if we can get you know, the simple things, as I said, coordinating, Vietnam goes as a, is an hour difference. They go to lunch at 12 o'clock, halfway through the Chinese lunch. So we end up with three hours, suppose, because there's an hour difference. Nobody coordinates these things. And then you come back to every time you have to handle the goods. Border handling costs money. Every time you have to transship from one truck or container or the load to another vehicle on the border, somebody's got to pay. And it ends up going to the cost of the goods that you are selling or to the factory that you invited in to build with an investment incentive down the road and he loads his truck and he goes to the border two hours and then he sits there for a day because he can't move. The every t as I say here, every time you stop, offload or transship, it costs money. Every handling facility has to be paid for. Except if, as in some of the cases, that is what you actually want. And there is an argument that in developing countries they actually want to have all this handling and want to have all this at the borders to increase local employment. But the question is, is that better than investing in smooth trans flowing through import-export so that the real benefit comes in major investments that are coming in? When you have multinational brands like mine, I used to work for TNT for many years, and like DHL, let's remember that TNT and DHL and all the others don't actually bring in drivers from Germany or the Netherlands or Australia. They employ local people. But they can't have the right kind of licenses in many places. Many of them have to be 51% nationally owned. So the multinational brands sit there in the middle, where um, in some countries a, a major Western organisation can't own the licence to run the trucks. So they have to have a local company that's doing it. Now the local company that's doing it, they don't come up to international standards. They don't have the security. They don't have the insurance, the liability cover. So when they're um, working for an Apple, um, an Asus, um, an HP, I'm looking at all the computers that are in the room, working for them, the guy at the bottom, the local companies, has a very small chance of getting into the global supply chain with the big companies. 
It's the guys at the top, the big brands who are already working for them. So what we have to do for investment in your area is to make sure that the local ones at the bottom can come up to the top. Because we have to make a business case. We have to make a risk. The, the Western organisation, the, the big company that's coming in, has to make a, a, a risk assessment, financial position, cash injections, etc., and the capex. So he has to go through a very major process to get through. Therefore, he tends to team up with the local company. Now, the local company think this is the investment. <coughs> which is as soon as they get some money, we'll go ahead and buy a new car for the boss. I kid you not, um, this is the commonest thing that we see around in my industry, in the logistics industry. I fly into places in the GMS and in ASEAN to see transport operations where the trucks are broken down and blowing black smoke, the tyres are bald, the vehicles are dangerous, yet the boss picks you up at the airport in a car like this, or a Mercedes, or a stretch them up, because the investment decisions are going the wrong way. Because may, we need to find ways of, and this comes back to something that we're working with, with the, um, the Freight Transport Association, Major companies, DHL, TNT, etc., etc., will tend to lease assets. We won't go out and buy coal, all the aeroplanes, all the trucks, all the equipment. So we need to be able to lease on the ground. Now that's fine for DHL, whose bank balance will pick it up. But the way that the small companies in your countries need to be able to lease the assets to operate in the business that they're in. They need to be able to lease, and um, as I've said here, you don't have to go to a bank. You have to go to Scania, you have to go to Volvo, you have to go to Mercedes, you have to go to MAN, Mitsubishi, I know, it doesn't matter. They will have leasing arms to put the equipment on the ground. But in terms of law, you need to think about their ability to reclaim the asset under failure. And that's what the standard point is. So when we're looking at policy, we really the ability to allow leasing reclaim. It went heavily wrong in um, Russia in the early 90s where the Mercedes and other people came in and started um, leasing trucks and then people decided they weren't going to pay for the trucks. And what was Mercedes going to do about it? Nothing. There's nothing you can do because there's no recourse to law in many of your countries. So that is an issue of policy, that if we can get recourse to law, then the leasing will follow. And the leasing, the private sector industries, all of the companies that make equipment will be happy to organise the leasing but they need to be able to get it back if something goes wrong, and that's a major policy issue. So, you probably all wondered in the presentation what this was about. Right? It's an expression I don't know if you've heard of, heard of before. The elephant in the room means what we don't talk about. The, the thing that is never mentioned, because it upsets everybody and it's too embarrassing like whether your wife says, do I look nice in this new dress? And that is corruption. Tea money and bribery. We make it sound very nice. We call it tea money. Right? We liken it to tipping a bellboy, pay for officials to process the paperwork before they go to lunch. Uh, generally accepted to be about $5 a time. We even had in developed countries, I used to work in Japan, where you'd send beer vouchers to the loading dock so that they load your trucks quicker and you send them a book of beer vouchers every month. But we extend calling it 
T money into the wider um, scope where it's pure bribery. And in developing countries, you've got to accept that people who make these investment decisions, the people who come from DHL, from TNT, from HP, from Apple, everybody else, will not only lose their job, but they could possibly end up in jail in their home country if they are caught being involved in this. Right? Bribery is endemic. We call it a good relationship. In many of the countries, you have the investment process must go through an agent because if you put the papers in yourself, they will stay on the bottom of the pile for months and months and months. So if you have to get an agent, and the agent just happened to have retired from that department three months ago, and set himself up as an agent who handles all of these investment and pays out the money into the department. Now, this used to be pushed aside, but it's now, I, as I said, I work for um, TNT. We have shut a country in this region because we could not get through the fact that every single time we had to do something, somebody had to pay somebody. We, as a Western company, are not allowed to do it. And the industry, if you want investments, you've got to be seen to be squeaky clean. And people will go and invest in squeaky clean countries. They will. It's not worth your job to recommend an investment where I've got to pay him and him and him. And as Tony said to me on the bus this morning, add twenty percent for the little bit of extra payments we might have to make. It is an elephant in the room, but you've got to, you know, Western companies are not soft touches. You've got to raise it up, put it out there, that it is no longer acceptable to pay customs officers to do their job. So, quickly, because the gentleman here is giving me nasty notes. <laughs> right. We want to go back to how we get small and medium enterprises into the value chain. Let's go what Raymond said before. And what you need is certainty. You need, and what I'm saying is you need certainty about how you get it there, when you get it there, how you can cross the border. It's not sitting there for three days. Right? You want to be a supplier to Toyota in Bangkok. You need to be there at 10 o'clock on a Thursday every Thursday and every Tuesday. Friday is no good, next Monday is no good. Do it twice and you're not there at 10 o'clock, you are no longer a supplier. So if you want your small and medium enterprises to grow in your country, you've got to give them certainty. Whether it be certainty through air delivery or even just across the border, you've got to know when it's coming, it's got to be guaranteed and it's got to be on time and in good condition. They don't need uncertain transit times, and they don't need to not know how much they're going to have to pay bribery today, next week, to get there. Right? In, ensuring fulfilment, I was trying to speed up here. You, if you want the small companies to be either suppliers in the automotive industry, the food industry, and from your countries, you've got to have a guaranteed and smooth supply chain. They've got to be able to get there. Right? Customs need to be user friendly. There are many countries that have user friendly customs. Right? Thailand has very user friendly customs. They'll do the paperwork next week. Pump it out, send it abroad, get it going, and then they'll come back and but other countries sit you there for three days while they work out whether you've got enough licenses to do this and that. That is killing the industry. Trade facilitation. Right? Think about these and read them. Trade facilitation that we all talk about is making it easier, simplifying, streamlining, and harmonizing. They're three important things. If you can take that back to your countries and say, oh, do we pass this test? So my thesis to end with here is that multimodal transport in the, the greater Mekong region, the six countries, and I extend this into many, many developing countries around. 
serves the import of consumer goods and not the GMS countries. New roads and bridges are done to improve market access to the hinterland, but the um, physical barriers are still dominant and we're paying, we've got the cheapest people in the world, but we're paying them more for transport than we ever need to do, and that goes on to what you're trying to sell. Right, I won't go through this because otherwise I'll be sorted out for the door. Right. But it's in the presentation, and the GMS Freight Transport Association, we're the body that brings the industry together in our region. There's a carrot in Central Asia, which does pretty much the same thing. We're working to improve the borders, to improve everything else. So there's a whole list of the sort of things in these plans on here that we're doing, right? Which are there to improve and advise governments at the local level. And one final point, right? Don't underestimate this, ladies and gentlemen. Do not underestimate the train, the movement to train away from sea and air. It's running now between China and Europe. HP shipped everything out of Chongqing to um, Europe by train every week, not by sea and not by air, through the different routes across Central Asia. But it could be so much better because as smaller shippers are trying to move, they are getting stuck at the borders for days and days and days. So that's causing the problem. So, I won't say the rest of the next 20 minutes of things I've got to say. So thank you very much, and I hope I didn't bore you to death. And the, the major issue I'm just saying is, if you want to, from a policy perspective, if you want people to come and invest in your country, Make it easy to get the stuff out when they've made it. Thank you.